I'm Sandy. I'm not sitting. But I'm Sandy. And I'm on concrete. But what else do I do? I walk. I'm not going to stand still and say, wow, viscosity. Resistance to flow due to cohesion of particles. Also known as thickness or stickiness of fluid. Blood is... Y'all want me to be like that? Yeah. Good, because I can't. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple of reasons I do that because I know I'm not getting any young. Okay? Plus, it actually makes my legs feel good, believe it or not. They're finding, <laughs> it, I can remember like when I was growing up. The support hose, okay, that you would see the older women use, all right? Y'all don't know, y'all don't know, y'all don't know, no more. So, oh my God, I bet it would take an hour to get them on because they were like true pantyhose, okay? It's so cool that they have come out with all these different types of compression socks now. They don't even have to be up to the knee. Some of them just simply go above the ankle because we have learned the importance because here's how blood that makes it to the tissues returns to the heart, okay? Arteries deliver the blood to the tissues. It's up to the veins to bring it back. Veins have to work against gravity. The way that we depend on return to the heart is by moving our muscles. I'm not dependent on return of blood to my heart in any other way. I need the muscles to move. Keep the circulation going and make sure that my cells get the nutrients they need and get rid of their waste. Make sense? So edema would be too much staying behind in the tissues. Now, when that happens, when water stays behind in the tissues, and if it becomes a chronic problem, ugh, that's not very good because it begins to affect my blood pressure, which is now going to affect my heart, which is now going to affect delivery to my tissues. It is not in any way separated. It is something that works together as a whole. We're looking at this one component of it, but it is not separate in any way from the blood to the vessels to the heart. So, osmolarity, basically the movement of the water is important for the blood. Now, one of the things that I'm seeing, which is great, except for the plastic bottles. Oh, okay. I see that a lot of you are taking in water. And that's good. I grew up in a time where everything was like Kool-Aid, sodas, tea, that sort of thing. And I actually have to struggle now to make sure I get my water in because that wasn't anything that was pushed when I was growing up. So, as y'all know, I keep my cups <coughs> with me. I start out every morning, as soon as my feet hit the floor, drinking an eight ounce of water out of a glass, not plastic. Okay? So, water is important 
because it hydrates, yes. They say, oh, but wait a minute, coffee has water? Tea has water? Oh, no, 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 no. Did we talk about what caffeine does to the brain? And then how that in turn causes more things to happen in the kidney for you to put out more urine? Is that not cool? Not cool, but cool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, water becomes very important for maintaining, believe it or not, maintaining everything. Something else that helps with this osmotic pressure is basically the proteins that we find in the blood. Now, because the proteins keep their structure, if you remember from part one, when we have a substance, that becomes a mixture, that sort of thing. One of the properties was colloids. And a colloid means that that substance has particles in it that keep their structure. So, one of the things that does get tested is something called COP, colloid osmotic pressure, which would be a testing of the proteins in the blood. So that means that those proteins are existing and they are keeping their complete structure, which I've already mentioned several times. Blood. Yeah. Ever heard it referred to as the life source? Source of life? Okay. Very true. All right. Something that we continuously produce. We don't stop. Okay, it's a fluid of the body that continuously has its parts, components, everything replaced continuously. As an adult, each day we produce roughly 400 billion platelets each day, you guys. 200 billion red blood cells. About 10 billion white blood cells. Every day. So if we're supposed to have so many fewer platelets and white blood cells than red blood cells, why do we produce twice the number of platelets than white blood cells? Now, that's based upon the fact that they're lifespans are different, okay, which we're going to get into. When they die off, where do they go? Ooh. Now, <clears throat> we're going to get to this, but for the most part, the red blood cell gets destroyed in the spleen. Something happens, first the spleen has to be taken out, the liver will take over. Doesn't want to, but it will. White blood cells. White blood cells are most likely going to, <clears throat> because they have a different lifespan, depending on which one we're referring to. Some of them last decades, some of them only a few days. So it depends upon which one we're referring to. They'll migrate to tissues, they'll migrate to lymph nodes or lymph tissue. With our platelets, platelets are going to have a specific lifespan and their their goal go around plug stuff up and even as we sit here and none of us may actually have something visible with the blood coming out okay internally things are constantly breaking and these little platelets go and help with the repair and then they're done. 
It happens all day, every day. 24-7, 365, 366 if it's a leap year. The production is called hemopoiesis. Heme, blood. Okay? Hemopoietic tissue begins at the time of fertilization. Egg and sperm meet. We begin to see one cell become two. We get something called a yolk sac, and yes, let that let that come to mind, just like you think of with a chicken egg. Okay? Now, that begins of tissues, cells, that creates what we call a blood island in the offspring. All right? Blastula, gastrula, all those cells that are beginning to form. We're going to produce primitive stem cells in the offspring because this is where it starts. Egg and sperm meet and this has to begin. So we give rise to primitive stem cells as the development continues. These stem cells migrate to the bone marrow liver, spleen, and thymus of the developing embryo. This begins very quickly in development. After birth, the only part that, begin, that continues to produce the blood cells, the, um, these cells that are needed, is going to be bone marrow. In children, every bone of their body, all the long bones, are going to be red bone marrow. So that they can grow. Once we become an adult, that changes. Only certain bones of the body, hip, femur, for example, are going to be areas to produce the cells. In what we call red bone marrow, it gives rise, it produces all seven of the formed elements. The red blood cells, the platelets, and all of the leukocytes, meaning the granulos and the agranulos. Because this is occurring in the bone marrow, it's termed myeloid hemopoiesis because the myeloid refers to the bone marrow. In the developing embryo, even though we see some of this production in the liver, the spleen, and the thymus, that's because the offspring is still <laughs> under direction of the mom. And actually, blood flow is a little opposite, it's a little different, okay? And then at birth, it reverses. Now, once we're born, well, those leukocytes, the white blood cells, some of them are going to have to go to these other parts, the thymus and our lymph tissue, to finish maturing. And we'll continue to talk about that. So the ones that have to go to, like the thymus, for example, that's going to be called lymphoid hemopoiesis because that is also a part of our lymphatic system. Even though the thymus gland was also part of our endocrine system. Remember how a lot of them were dual or triple or whatever?